Very good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPD program organized by Society for Health Research and Innovation and Government Medical Officers Association. Our webinar link will be open for you today until 10 15 a.m. and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should attend till the end of the webinar to obtain e certificate for participation. The link for applying e certificate will be sent to the chat box at the end of the session. CPD points will be given to you, which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines, and the chat box will be open for your queries and they will be answered at the end of the session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphone and also switch off the video to avoid any interruption during the session. Now, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Medhavini Disanayaka, Senior Registrar in Cornea and External Eye Disease at Cornea Unit, National Eye Hospital, Colombo. The session will be on Common Eye Diseases we see. Now, this is over to you, Madam. Uh, good morning. So the topic today is common eye diseases we see. There'll be a little few uncommon ones as well. Uh, let's start off. So uh, the objectives I made uh, based on the questions that have been sent to us previously. These are some of the diseases. We are going to revise the anatomy and the physiology of the eye first, and then we are going to discuss uh, some diseases and presentations. And at the end of the a discussion we can have some questions so let's start off with the anatomy of the eye so uh, basically uh, the globe sits in the orbit and now in the orbit you get the lacrimal gland um, and uh, there are also lacrimal gland it's a main tear secreting organ apart from that there are some oil uh, like tears uh, uh, oil component of the tear secreted by lid margin tear glands and mucus is secreted from conjunctival goblet cells. So then uh, the tears get drained through the lacrimal sac, the, the drainage system into the nasolacrimal duct and into the inferior uh, uh, meatus of the nose. If we look at the globe and the beads and take a look at the conjunctiva, the conjunctiva uh, starts actually at the limbus. The limbus is the corneostereal junction and then falls back over itself and is uh, lining the underside or the inner side of the eyelid. And then it ends right at the lid margin. Okay? So um, the pockets on the upper and lower part of the lids are called pornices. Beyond that, the conjunctiva doesn't exist. There are only connective tissue called tenons that envelops the eye, 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 the globe. If you look at the globe proper, you can see that uh, you have the conjunctival lining, the sclera underneath, and uh, beyond that, you have the choroid and the retina that is in the posterior segment. Anterior segment starts off with the clear transparent cornea. Then you have the iris. Between the iris and the cornea is the anterior chamber, which is composed of aqueous humor. The crystalline lens sits behind the iris, and it's actually hanging in the uh, inside the globe, uh, suspended by the sonules, suspensory ligaments. They are attached to the ciliary body and the ciliary processes, right? Then the posterior segment, uh, inside that you have the vitreous, the transparent rim gel-like substance. Then behind that, all the nerve fiber layers from the retina pass through the optic nerve uh, into the uh, central nervous system. Uh, and in the middle of the optic nerve, you get the central retinal artery and the vein. The main retinal blood supply comes from the choroid, but there is also another blood supply from the retinal arteries. Uh, physiology, just very, very uh, uh, small introduction. We have uh, the aqueous produced in the posterior chamber of the eye, that is from the ciliary processes, and the aqueous human then flows through the pupil into the anterior chain, then out of the eye through the angle. The angle has a trabecular measure, which is, a, which is like a filter really. And then uh, the fluid flows into the aqueous, uh, sorry, Schlem's canal and the aqueous vein and out of the air. 
uh, another bit of physiology that is important to know is that the eye is actually protected in different ways to the other organs of the rest of the body. So the um, main thing is the eye is very delicate and very small. So you can't have an immune reaction similar to the rest of the body uh, to attack any foreign organisms. So instead of having a strong immune reaction, it actually has a suppressed immune mechanism. And uh, uh, for protection, it has barium, barium, uh, barriers formed. So there's the epithelial barrier in the front of the eye, that's the cornea. Uh, those tight junctions in the epithelium prevent anything going in. Then there are barriers in the retinal arteries uh, and also in the uh, anterior chamber. So these prevent any immunogens, allergens, or proteins unnecessarily coming into the eye and causing, an, uh, causing infection or some immune reaction. So this is the protection. So basically, if any of the barriers break, there is a chance that the eye can have a huge infection or reaction. Now let's look at some of the diseases. So one of the presentations that come to us is uh, neonatal tearing, neonatal or infantile tearing, and also adult tearing. So the commonest cause of infants coming with, it, with tearing, that is uh, this kind of uh, uh, just normal tears, colorless tears, uh, secreted out with a, uh, it can be slightly mucoid, but generally not parivert. This kind of presentation with the, with the white eye, non-inflamed eye, is generally due to a congenital obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct. This is normal up to one year, because in some children, it just takes one year for the uh, nasolacrimal duct to get patent, right? So all you need to do is massage that Area. The parent has to massage it with one finger, either the index or the little finger, downwards along the nasolacrimal duct, the anatomy of the nasolacrimal duct, and help the tears to drain out. So you don't need to give antibiotics or anything. If you want, you can give a little bit of physiotherapy ointment. The sinister thing about uh, the differential diagnoses, which are sinister, are neonatal conjunctivitis like monococcal uh, conjunctivitis, HSV. Uh, uh, such things are, especially in the neonatal period, are blinding. So yeah, if the discharge is very turbulent and the child doesn't open his eyes at all, then this is significant. Uh, the other, another cause is congenital glaucoma. Congenital glaucoma presents with tearing corneal cloudiness and photophobia. So they, the children refuse to go in the sunlight. They, the corneal clouding may or may not be seen initially. Okay? So these are, you, you have to keep in mind about these uh, um, differential diagnosis. Um, so this is basically what I said, you massage and then you review. Uh, reassure and if it's not improving I think you have to refer and the uh, uh, consultant will decide on whether to probe or not basically make the duct fate patent or not. In adults it's uh, the acquired nasolacrimal drug uh, uh, block is usually due to an infection. So infection uh, you have if it is associated with lacrimal sac infection or dacrocystitis you have to give a systemic antibiotic like an oral antibiotic and maybe a topical antibiotic to go along with the tears into the lacrimal sac. Once the infection is clear you look for patency of the duct. If the duct is not patent you might consider that uh, dacrocystorhinostomy which is a, uh, you make a surgical uh, pathway from the lacrimal sac into the nose and allow those tears to drain. Now, another cause is imperforation or block of the uh, uh, canaliculus or the punctum. So you have to examine the eyes under the slit lamp and check whether uh, the puncta are okay, whether there's a discharge there um, uh, and all those things. And of course, tearing can also be due to other causes, like in adults, especially like dry eyes, chronic dry eyes, any other cause of ear, uh, irritation of the eye. So those have to be excluded by examination first before you uh, assume that it is due to a blocked nasolacrimal duct. Let's uh, move on to trauma. So um, trauma. Uh, uh, can be blunt trauma 
or perforating, that is open globe trauma. So in trauma, you have to get a proper history, but sometimes it's difficult, especially in pediatric patients, the history may be difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, and even in adults, sometimes they don't remember what hit them. Uh, so let's look at blunt trauma first. So one of the uh, common presentation of blunt trauma is some subconjunctival hemorrhage. So they come with a hemorrhage. It appears like this, just a, a homogeneous kind of redness in the, under the conjunctiva. Uh, the thing with blunt trauma is if it's associated with a severe uh, force, a lot of other things in the globe can also be damaged. This may not be visible with a torch. So you have to examine under the slit lamp. Um, and look for these things, such as, let me look at some pictures. Um, so this is the mechanism of blunt trauma. The blunt trauma pushes uh, the globe anteroposteriorly, and this produces pressure, which uh, 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 causes the equatorial area of the globe to expand. This expansion causes these lens, iris, and other uh, important uh, ocular uh, components to sort of evolve and you get anterior chamber uh, reactions. This is traumatic uveitis. Uh, these things here you can see like dust particles. These are anterior chamber cells. Normally you don't see anterior chamber cells, but when you uh, magnify uh, uh, the slit beam at around one millimeter width at highest illumination and look through, you can see the cells. Then this is uh, sphincter damage. You can see that the sphincter in the inferior part of the pupil is irregular, unlike the superior part. This is again an indicative of severe force. Uh, high femur, iris dialysis, and lens subluxation. So this one, because the sonios can get broken uh, at one part of the eye, the lens gets pushed to one side. It can even uh, go back and forth into the vitreous, it can come forward into the anterior chamber. Then you have inside the retina, you can get bruising of the retina, which is known as commotion retina. This glassy pearly appearance interiorly in the retina is the, the bruising, and this can be associated with retinal tears and lead to retinal detachments. Now let's look at open globe uh, damage. So sometimes it's over and it's very obvious where there's a lot of this kind of lead lacerations, facial, uh, facial um, uh, damage, uh, where you will be suspecting open globe trauma. But sometimes it's very small and subtle. So this is a corneal laceration where the iris is incarcerated. So this the patient may actually come to, you, uh, come to us and um, the patient may just feel uh, reluctant to open the eyes. So the important thing is to suspect uh, uh, open globe injury, depending on the history and uh, the, pres uh, the presentation, really. And then when you are examining, just uh, don't press on the globe. So the, the blood and other debris might be occluding your view. You can clean those up with very gentle pressure, no pressure at all, actually, very gently, and then have an idea about the extent of the globe injury. And then uh, make sure that it is ocular trauma because sometimes lid laceration, uh, sorry, brow laceration, forehead lacerations cause bleeding and accumulation of blood in the orbital cavity, and it has actually no trauma to the globe. So I, we have to clean up the blood and have a look at it. Uh, then antibiotics, we can start. Preservative free antibiotics are the best. Uh, there's only one brand uh, which is not available in the garment sector, but you have to ask them to get from outside and put, uh, which is preservative free because the preservatives are not very good uh, if it goes inside the eye. So preservative free antibiotic, and then you send the patient to a place where the globe rupture can be repaired. Right? So transfer. Then uh, we have to also think about other causes of chronic chronic or uh, pain and irritation, maybe of a few days duration. So patient may come and say they've been, uh, uh, they've been exposed to dust particles or wind, or it might be some grinding injury or something like that. 
and they have their persistent pain, irritation, and tearing. So here you have to suspect a uh, conjunctival or corneal foreign body or a corneal epithelial defect. So let's see. So this is a picture of the subtarsal conjunctiva, the subtarsal conjunctiva. If you look at it look closely, you can see here, uh, there are these uh, tiny uh, caterpillars yeah, that have been, uh, that are stuck in the conjunctiva and the ends are protruding out. Caterpillar hair is notorious to get into uh, the eye like this and stay there. And it's very hard to detect even in the stoop lamp. You have to be very suspicious. Now these ends, they rub on the cornea and cause irritation. So um, you have to remove these things. They can actually go inside the cornea and uh, the, the cornea will seal itself and they go into the anterior chamber also because they're so fine. Now, if you look at this, this is an obvious uh, piece of uh, foreign body in the subtarsal area. So you have to invert the eyelid and have a look. This is a corneal foreign body. This kind of presentation is common with metallic foreign bodies after grinder, you know, uh, people who work with grinders, they get metallic foreign bodies if they don't use protection, protective goggles and all that. So this is stuck onto the cornea. And these are epithelial defects. Epithelial defects are hard to detect without a slit lamp really. And of course, um, uh, you can see them better with chlorophyll staining on the tears. So um, all of these things, a corneal foreign body especially, uh, has to be excluded uh, before you just give antibiotic and send them away. So they have to be removed. Now let's have a look at how to reverse the upper eyelid. Uh, this is technique I think everyone should know. Just get the patient to relax, tell them what you're going to do and that it might be a little uncomfortable. Tell them to relax and look downwards. Then pull out the upper uh, eyelid from the lashes and then use a cotton bud, a pen, or if you have tiny fingers, you can use your finger and press above the lid. Now, don't press closer to the lash line because you have a tarsal plate here which will not bend. So you have to go about four or five millimeters away from the lid margin. You use the cotton bud, cotton tip uh, to add pressure and then you gently revert it from the lash. Okay? So that's how you revert the eyelid. Now, uh, what if you don't remove the corneal foreign body? or they have come with the delayed presentation. The cornea gets infected and you get corneal ulcers, even epithelial defects. Most of the corneal ulcers occur with normal flora of the eye. Normal flora have uh, uh, dangerous organisms as well, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, normally these organisms can't penetrate in an intact epithelium. So uh, they wait till the epithelium gets abraded and then they infect, right? So any cause of epithelial damage, um, there is a risk of it going into a corneal ulcer. Especially if the trauma was related to uh, soiled or contaminated objects, like say sand, dust, rocks, uh, things like that, or uh, due to tree branches that are associated with fungal infection. So uh, there is a risk of getting a corneal infection. Corneal infections are very dangerous. So if you don't have a slit lamp, at least from the torch, examine the cornea properly. And if you find a corneal infection like this white dot, this is infection, you have to refer and uh, start them immediately on antibiotics and antifungals as necessary. Now, let's have a look at some answers. Now, the thing uh, with corneal ulcers is we get a lot of referrals where uh, some doctors have used steroids or combination uh, antibiotics with steroids. This is just for the red dye, as you probably assume that conjunctivitis or something. Do not start steroids, if in, especially in the case of trauma, uh, trauma uh, and where you have not been able to examine the eye properly under a sleep time, avoid using steroids. This is the kind of picture. Now, initially it may be a dot, but when you put steroids, 
the immunity is reduced so much. The cornea is a um, evascular structure, so there's hardly any mechanism for it to defend itself, really. And uh, when you put steroids, it's even worse, and the infection just spreads. So you can imagine pseudo, the organism like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, aeruginosa, which is anyway virulent, and over one to two days, it can spread really into really bad corneal ulcers. Now they thrived when you put steroids. And the, this kind of corneal ulcers, when it starts small, it spreads and becomes like this. So this is the, when, when the patient comes to us, us, it looks like this. Now, sadly, when we do, we can't really do surgery on them as well. Now, this is a very severe pseudomonas infection where the cornea is completely melted and the infection has even gone into the sclera and the conjunctiva. So here we can't really find we, we, uh, a margin, a clear margin to do surgery and remove the organism and do a graft. This is a, a, such a, a such an attempt where a PKP or a, a graft has been put to remove the organism, but we can see that the margins are infection, infected. So basically it's very hard to clear out the infection if it has spread all the way to the limbus. This is another graft which have which we have done for an ulcer but you can see that it's a very large the, the graph the larger the graph is the unlikely it's going to um, the, uh, the more unlikely it is going to be to be a, a healthy uh, visually uh, uh, I mean a graph with good visual potential so this is just the preservation of the globe really but vision will definitely be very poor in this kind of patient and visual prognosis is also poor because repeated graphs will not work. So avoid steroids, basically avoid steroids and, um, unless you know what you're really doing and you have actually examined the patient under a sleep lamp and an excluded infection, please don't use steroids, please use just antibiotics on uh, especially trauma and all of that. Now let's look at conjunctivitis, another common presentation. Um, let's look at other causes of, I mean, causes of red dye and how to differentiate conjunctivitis from other causes. Now we all already talked a bit about corneal ulcers. In conjunctivitis, you get conjunctal hyper, conjunctival, conjunctival hypemia that involves the whole conjunctiva. So remember uh, when I spoke about the anatomy of the conjunctiva, the conjunctiva also drapes the inner layer of the uh, leaves, right? And also the anterior bit of the anterior part of the globe. So when you lift up the lift up the lid, you can see that the whole conjunctiva in that upper part is injected or hyperemic. This is this can be seen in large corneal ulcers, may not be seen so much in small corneal ulcers. The hyperemia may be smaller. In uveitis or anterior chamber infections, you get a ciliary injection. That is only this anterior bit near the limbus, that is the corneosphere junction. These vessels are the injected ones. So not the uh, peripheral conjunctiva. That is why. So if you, that is because these vessels are uh, supplying and raiding the anterior chamber. So the anterior chamber blood supply is from these vessels, the anterior lingual vessels. So any injection there indicates that something is happening in the anterior chamber. Then scleritis and episcleritis. Uh, scleritis and episcleritis can be nodular or diffuse. That is, nodular is this, where the on, there is a nodular elevation, which is red. So this is not conjunctivitis. Diffuse ones generally takes up a sector of uh, conjunctiva, not the whole conjunctiva again. Um, the rest of the conjunctiva may be normal. Rarely it can involve the whole conjunctiva as well. The difference between scleritis and episcleritis is scleritis is extremely painful uh, and tender. Episcleritis is just mild irritation kind of pain, not really that uh, severe. Trauma, subconjunctival hemorrhage, 
as we discussed earlier, it's just the bleeding in, underneath the conjunctiva. You may or may not may not see a level actually uh, or a margin basically. You can have the whole conjunctiva involved as well. Um, uh, that's different from conjunctival and con, uh, conjunctival inflammation. This is just bleeding, not an inflammation. Uh, then, of course, there are other causes, many other causes like blepharitis, dry eyes, any irritants. So, uh, any lead diseases would cause chronic irritation to the eye and also red eye. So, um, that you have to examine and exclude. So, that's how you differentiate conjunctivitis, basically. Right. So, conjunctivitis uh, can be uh, infective or non infective. Infective viral conjunctivitis is the commonest. Bacteria is more common, bacterial conjunctivitis is more common in children. Um, so, uh, in infective conjunctivitis, you get an basically most of the time it's an acute onset presentation with tearing, discharge, grittiness, photophobia. Uh, they can have itching um, and uh, they may have other features of uh, upper respiratory tract infections like pharyngitis, fever, and sometimes pre auricular lymphadenopathy. Allergic conjunctivitis or vernal cancer conjunctivitis, that's more common in children, young adults and children, and that is associated with very severe itching, very severe itching. Itching is the main complaint really, and uh, the presentation is a subacute or chronic, not generally acute. And the discharge is milder, not that virulent, as is the conjunctival injection. Now, uh, uh, on examination, you in infective ones, you can get follicles or papillae, and uh, you can get membrane formation. I will show you uh, the uh, pictures. And keratitis is generally a patchy sort of uh, subepithelial uh, keratitis. The, Exception to this is, of course, gonorrhea, where there is severe melting of the cornea. In vernal ketoconjunctivitis, you, the ulcer you get is a shield ulcer, which is due to uh, rubbing or friction of the uh, high, uh, hypertrophic upper lip conjunctiva. It's just a frictional kind of ulcer. And uh, you get giant papillae under the conjunctiva. Uh, you can get some corneal aggregates. At the pictures. So, this is chemosis, that is conjunctival edema uh, due to the inflammation. This is more, this is seen in uh, infective conjunctivitis. This is a pseudomembrane formation, it's basically, it's like a membrane formed and attached to the conjunctiva. These are these tiny dots here, are the uh, follicles that are produced. Um, in uh, infective conjunctivitis, so you have to lift, uh, invert the upper lid and have a look. This is the kind of discharge, the uh, parulent discharge you see, and this is the keratitis, commonly tadinoitis actually. This is uh, you call it tadinoitis keratitis or neural keratitis. This is the picture you get in vernal ketoconjunctivitis. These are giant papillae, so hypertrophy of the conjunctiva. Uh, then you have these nimble aggregates of inflammatory cells um, and all that. And you have this uh, shield also that is what I mentioned earlier about the friction caused by this upper lip dropping on the cone. These are chronicity features that is also a part of um, allergic conjunctivitis, really allergic over where you can see that the cornea has now started to vascularize because, because of chronic ocular surface damage because of the conjunctivitis. So, these are more in the uh, allergic or vernal ketoconjunctivitis group and not infected. So, uh, as we mentioned earlier, viruses are the commonest cause of conjunctivitis, and from there also, adenovirus is the uh, most common. It's very infectious. And for treatment, uh, as you all know, for viruses, we do need antibiotics. So, so antibiotics only prevent a secondary infection. Steroids, again, 
epithelial defects are uh, this thing where steroids, steroids are started. Um, eye rubbing, because this is associated with uh, chinus, you can get, uh, the patient will really want to rub the eyes. So you can give them cold compression, ask them to ferment the eyes with uh, cold water and uh, tell them to avoid eye rubbing. And most importantly, you have to prevent cross infection. It's highly infectious. So it, they, it spreads via tears and fomites. So they had to wash their hands, pillowcases, bed sheets, dirty handkerchiefs, and uh, maybe take leave from work, etc., to prevent the spread. So uh, how do you treat? Uh, generally, just give them artificial tears. The tears lubricate and uh, give them symptomatic relief. And also, this, uh, especially this adenovirus tends to, if it is in the corneal case, keratitis and all that, it tends to stay in the corneal epithelium and with friction, it gets reactivated. So that is also prevented with artificial tears. So you give them tears for about three days. You can also give a fusitan appointment if you're worried about secondary infections or something. And then review them uh, in about three to four days. So if generally, it would be improving by then if it's nothing very uh, uh, done. If you're suspecting by this time uh, bacterial uh, conjunctivitis, bacteria conjunctivitis has a more parulent kind of discharge, very parulent kind of discharge can be associated with sinusitis. So in that case, you can give them a chloramphenicol ointment or, or floxacine, get floxacine drops and then review again, maybe in a week's time or so on, so forth. And uh, if they are not improving or you're worried, uh, if there is uh, the membranous, the pseudomembrane formation is very severe, then I think uh, you have to see them under a sleep lamp and then maybe start a steroid, steroid then. And again, in steroids, we don't generally start off with dexamethasone or metamethasone, we start off with the chloramethasone because fluoromethylone doesn't go inside the eye. If, it, if a steroid goes inside the eye, there is a higher chance of getting cataracts and glaucoma. So to avoid, to avoid that, I mean, you don't need the steroid to go in and work inside the eye. You want it to work on the surface. So fluoromethylone is fine. Um, but then again, that is only better to start if it is only severe and uh, very severe and you have actually examined properly. Uh, if, the, if the patient is improving with the tears by three days, we just continue the tears even after conjunctivitis has settled because now the adenovirus can stay in the corneal epithelium and reactivate and cause keratitis. So you want to avoid that. So you continue the, uh, the tears for some more weeks. Uh, adenovirus keratitis, uh, again, like I said, uh, so if you, uh, you can start off, uh, the keratitis looks like that, the sort of uh, patchy appearance in the cornea is keratitis. The keratitis is associated with viruses commonly. So here, you, uh, the mainstay is lubricants because it just um, activates in the epithelium. If you are starting fluoromethylone, uh, you have to check the IOP, monitor them, tail off as soon as possible. When the staining stops, fluorescent staining stops on the epithelium, that means uh, it's not the, uh, the, the activity in the epithelium has died down. And even if you see white dots that which are not staining, those are probably scarring. And uh, there's no disease activity really. The scars take longer to clear off. Uh, so you continue the tears and tail off the fluoromethylone. Let's uh, look at another presentation now. Squints, uh, or suspected squints. So parents come and tell that their child has a um, deviation of one eye. So here, what the first picture here shows an ESO deviation. Uh, that means the eye are looking inwards, eyes are looking inwards. This is an exo deviation, or the eyes are looking outwards. So uh, sometimes, especially little babies, they look like they have a squint, but they actually don't have a squint. Now, this girl also looks like she, ha she has a squint, but exo deviation, but actually doesn't. So how do you say whether they have a squint or not? You shine, you ask them, I mean, if it's possible, 
you give them a target uh, for, uh, and hold it far away and shine a torch in their eyes. So you can see the reflex on the cornea. Now the fixating eye, you will get the corneal reflex in the center. And if you look at the corneal reflex in the other eye, it is not in the center. It's not symmetric. Here it's in the, because it's a nasal deviation, it's in the outer part of the cornea. And here it's in the inner part. Now, if you look at these two children, this baby, the corneal reflex is right in the center. So although they look like they have a squint because the inner portion of the sclera is not visible because of the broad nasal bridge really, they don't really have a squint. And this child also looks like that, but doesn't have a squint. Another way is to get them to fix it at the target and then you gently cover uh, the, the fixating eye, the, the eye which is looking at the target, you gently close. And if there is a movement of the other eye to take up fixation, that means this eye has, has uh, been removed. So then they have an actual squint. So how do you assess? You have to uh, examine the squint basically and um, uh, there are the associations of muscle palsy, this may be. Uh, etc. So you have to examine them carefully. You have to examine the fungus because uh, usually squints occur uh, because of a reduction in vision in one eye. The reduction can be due to any reason, maybe a refractive error, but can also be due to a very sinister pathology in the fungus, like retinoblastoma, especially in children. So you, you have to examine the uh, uh, fungus. Then in children, you have to check the vision. This is done by cytopedic refraction. This is not the same kind of uh, spectacle measurement we do in adults because they have very high accommodative power. They like to accommodate. There is automatically accommodate. So you have to relax the eye using uh, cytopedics. And then uh, you, uh, once the effect of the drug is on, you repeat the uh, refraction. So this you have to do, and then you send the patient to an optician who is a person who measures uh, objectively the squint. So red ref if you can't assess the fungus, you check the red reflex with the ophthalmoscope. You just look from far away, you look through the ophthalmoscope, point the light beam at the eye, and you can actually see the red reflex. So if you see a white reflex, that means there is some kind of pathology like this. This is a retinoblastoma, right? So we have to all uh, know how to check the red reflex. Even if we can't look at the, we don't have the facility to look at the fungus. Uh, management, uh, squints don't really always need surgery. Sometimes if you correct the refractive error with spectacles, the squint automatically can correct. If you correct the amblyopia, that is the brain, are not developing to receive the vision, me, the vision of the weak guy. Uh, so you have to force the brain to respond that to the vision of that guy. That is amblyopia. So if you correct the amblyopia, maybe uh, the screen can correct by itself. So basically, those are the things you can do. Um, right now, let's look at refractive errors very, very briefly. So these are the common refractive errors we come across. Sometimes we come across combinations of these. So normally in the eye, uh, you have uh, the cornea and the lens giving you the refractive power. Majority is from the cornea, one third is from the uh, lens. And these refract the eye and focus it on the foreground. So the length of the eye has to match the refractive power of the cornea and the lens. If there, it doesn't match, or the this is too powerful or less powerful, uh, or the eye is too long or too short, these uh, rays don't focus on the pole. So you, all the, and uh, apart from that, all the light from any meridian, that is any cross section, the light should, uh, all the light from any meridian should focus on the retina, right? All should focus. So the refractive uh, power of the cornea should be equally, any part of the eye. Now, uh, in myopia generally, the eye is too long in re uh, relation to the power of the refractive properties. In hypermetropia, the eye is too short. So you give a spherical lens to, lens, lens, uh, uh, to correct a hypermetropia, 
and you give a biconcave lens to correct the myopia. Now, uh, these are the, like, basically all the cross, -section of, cross sections of this lens will have uh, equal power. So, this is known as a spherical lens. So, astigmatism is slightly different. Astigmatism, the corneal refractive power is the main culprit. In myopia and hypermetropia, it's mainly the axial lens. But in um, astigmatism, commonly it's the corneal power. So, the, what happens is one meridian or one cross section of the cornea has either more power or less power than the other cross section. So, it doesn't focus on the retina. Right? One cross section, the rest of it is okay. That is regular astigmatism. Regular astigmatism. Irregular is when you have a scar and nothing really focuses properly, regularly. So regular astigmatism can be corrected by a cylinder. Usually we put a, um, a minus cylinder or concave cylinder uh, in the um, uh, axis, which is steepest. So it has to, basically not in the axis, but it has to act on the axis, which is steepest. Right? So a minus cylinder. Let's, let's look at some prescriptions so you know what the patient has. So here, this is a spherical lens. So this indicates whether the patient has myopia or hypermetropia. In this case, the power is zero. So the patient doesn't need a spherical lens. But the patient has uh, is in need of a cylinder. That means there is an uh, astigmatism. So the patient only has an astigmatism, which requires a minus 2.5 uh, diopter lens in this axis, that is the axis. And it has, it has given, given him the maximum correction of 6-9 vision. Pinhole also gives 6-9 vision. This is the reading end. So reading end is only, you, know, you can see here, this patient has a reading end. That means this is a presbyopic patient, most likely. So about 40 years of age. Uh, this patient has a 1.75 1, 1 sphere here, plus. So that means this is a hypermetro with a minus six cylinder, giving him six, six minus vision. This is the axis, right? This eye is completely normal. So uh, important thing, uh, point, in children, you have to, uh, if children with poor vision, children has to be, uh, have to be assessed at least once under the sleep ramp, and you need a dilated fund, dilate fundoscopy to exclude any intraocular pathology leading to reduced vision. So uh, they need the spectacle correction is generally after cyclic rigid refraction, uh, refraction, not by the routine refraction we do for adults. Then every six months, four to six months, this is small children, less than 10 years at least, even teenagers, sometimes you need to uh, relieve them four to six months and check their vision again because they are in their growth spurt. So they're likely to have spectacle uh, changes quite frequently and they don't tell you when they can't see. So they'll just be uh, unable to do their work because they can't see and they won't complain. So you need to assess them, do a repeat retraction every four to six months. Then uh, somebody had asked a question about healthy, healthy eye habits. So um, you have to get them to work and look at distance or distant objects. So it is the healthy habit, really. You can't just let them, especially nowadays, they are always on the smartphones. So they have to go outside and play. They have to look at outdoor distant trees and the sky, etc. And uh, that uh, let's their eye sort of look at distant things and uh, prevent progression of myopia, etc. Myopia is linked to near work and the duration of near work. So you have to break that. Uh, you have to give them regular break from break from near vision and then um, avoid them looking at their smart devices and books at very close distance, so especially in the beds because of gravity, the object tends to move towards your eye fall towards your face. So avoid near work, including the use of phone in the bed. Um, then, so I have a book where you can refer. So first I check up if they are complaining of reduced vision, I think you have to send to an eye unit where the eyes will be checked, examined completely and uh, given proper glasses. And then if they need really frequent changes, there's a chance of them having uh, keratoconus. I talked about keratoconus spoon. 
Then if the vision doesn't correct to six, six, suspicion of uh, squint, if the family has uh, other diseases, you have to say some other ways of vision correction, contact lenses, laser refractive surgery. No. These are the press biopia on small web, just um, starts at around four years of age. That is when the reading distance basically gets affected. Um, so you can give any kind of lens. Usually, uh, if they, are, they have been given bifocals, you can't uh, change them to progressive lenses. They get used to bifocals. So if they like, you have to start off with progressive lenses. Now let's talk about keratoconus. Um, I'm working in a cornea unit, so I'll go into town here. But uh, <laughs> briefly, what happens in keratoconus? It, it is an ectasial disease. Basically, the cornea is not strong enough to sort of withstand the pressure of the eye, the normal pressure of the eye. So it just starts to cone out, right? Gradually cone out. At around 30 years, this stops automatically because the cornea with aging stiffens. So basically, um, uh, by 30 years, the damage has been done, but it stops progressing at that age. This is the type of uh, irregular thinning and cornea seeing asymmetrical uh, protrusion of the cornea. At one point, the posterior lamella of the cornea can rupture when it's a very advanced keratoconus. It can cone so much that the posterior lamella ruptures and the cornea gets hydrated by the aqueous medium. So this we call hydrosis and scars. So basically, if you catch keratoconus in its very early stages, where you can correct the uh, vision with spectacles or contact lenses and correct it right up to 6-6 six, six vision, um, and there's uh, adequate corneal thickness also left, then um, uh, you can do a, a procedure called cross-linking with topical anesthesia, which stops the progression of, of the ketone. It doesn't really improve the vision, but it stops the progression. So if they're happy with spectacles in the initial state, you can cross-link the eye. That is much better than the next option, which is uh, available for uh, very advanced that is keratoplasty, that is um, uh, grafts basically. Nowadays, we don't do full thickness grafts with keratoconus, we do only the corneal um, uh, external layers. 90% of the external layers are replaced, uh, 90%. This is one of those, the appearance of such a graft. So, uh, this is better for the uh, longevity of the graft, really, than a full thickness one. This is a, obviously a surgical challenging um, procedure and also for the patient, once you do a graft, any graft really, it's a lifelong commitment. So, and uh, the vision rehabilitation also after graft can take up to a year. It's not immediate vision rehabilitation post of day one. So you don't want the child to go into this stage. You want to detect keratoconus early and treat with cross-linking, which is a much more cheaper and effect, um, more tolerable procedure than grafting. So uh, if a teenager or young adult needs frequent change of spectacles, they can be myopia, commonly astigmatism, and um, uh, then you have to do a topography, send to an unit, they will do a topography, and uh, exclude keratoconus and within the speech. Let's look at primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, this is common in the uh, old age group. Uh, glaucoma has to be suspected uh, and screened for because uh, patients are asymptomatic in open angle glaucoma. So what they have is peripheral vision loss. So the vision starts to lose uh, in the periphery first. So the patient doesn't really notice the vision loss until it starts up, it becomes so advanced and the central vision starts to deteriorate. So uh, they don't come and tell you until the central vision is gone and then it is too late basically. If you catch it early and control the intraocular pressure, you prevent the ganglion cells dying and you can prevent them growing, going into blind. So basically, uh, you have to screen for uh, open angle glaucoma. 
how do you screen you look at the disk right um, disk if you look at the disk here okay in the disk you get the ganglion cells cell uh, layer or the nerve fiber the axons of the ganglion cells going into the optic nerve now the most peripheral la uh, nerve layers are in like the periphery the most central nerves goes in the superficial part of the nerve right so this is the on in the retina this is how they go they go the, uh, the superior part of the retina goes from the superior part of the optic nerve head and the inferior part passes through the inferior part of the optic nerve head mm -hmm. so this is the optic so take this as optic nerve uh, head so on the disc the red bit is the ganglion cells the axons of the ganglion cells the center bit which is uh, called the cuff is actually the visible sclera or the fibriform that clay uh, that is the area which is not passing the axons so these are the nerve cells and this is the fibriform clay so what happens is with the depth of the ganglion cells this cuff or the area the hip the sclera or the fibriform plate which is visible becomes larger and larger because the neuroreticular end becomes thinner and thinner. So you can see this eye. This is a normal cup to disc ratio of about 0.4. And this is an increased vertical cup to disc ratio. We are always worried about the vertical cup to disc ratio because as I showed in that picture, uh, this vertical bit is the most susceptible part of the disc so you can see here this is how it appears now this is very advanced cupping this is early cupping so you want to detect uh, early cupping uh, inferior thinning superior thinning is more significant um, i think there is a handbook by uh, Dr. Madam. if you can uh, get hold of it it's very informative and also the Asia Pacific guidelines you can download or download on the internet about glaucoma and how to detect this copy, right? Um, because we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. These are the options of management. Initially, we start so the treatment is to uh, reduce the intraocular pressure. So the main problem is that they can't tolerate the intraocular pressure. Whether it is a normal intraocular pressure with a weak optic disc or high intraocular pressure activities if they can't tolerate it. So you have to reduce the intraocular pressure. So that can be done with medication. That is the first line uh, of treatment. So you start off, generally start off with the prostaglandin analog. Some people don't start, they start off with the beta blocker, which is fine. And uh, the last option is trabeculectomy and um, glaucoma drainage devices. So these actually make an artificial exit for the aqueous humor into the subconjunctival space so that um, uh, basically you are reducing uh, the intraocular pressure. This is what the surgical uh, objective is. The gold standard still is trabeculectomy all over the world. Um, right. So a bit about angle closure because we are talking about emergencies as well. Angle closure occurs when the pupillary margin rests and gets stuck on the basically on the uh, lens uh, when it's mid dilated. And this prevents the aqueous flow from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber. So there's a block here. And the aqueous humor starts accumulating here in the posterior chamber and blocks the angle. Right? So you get a very shallow anterior chamber, acute onset redness, pain, tearing and cloudiness of the cone. That is a presentation. So what do you do? They may or may not have had uh, previous episodes. So management, you have to reduce the pain. So you can do oral analgesics and rheumatics. And uh, examine the eye, look, look for a secondary cause as well. Like if it, there's a subluxated lens, or as I showed you earlier, if the zonules are weak and the lens has migrated forward, it can cause an angle closure that appears uh, like uh, that and uh, tropidomate is a notorious drug to have a side effect of angle closure then uh, after that uh, once you have excluded those causes you can treat them with aqueous suppression and also pilocarpine polymagic agonist um, the uh, this uh, this 
prevents, the, I mean, this reduces the aqueous suppressants, reduce the IOP. The pyrocarbine uh, pushes back the IVC and diaphragm to open the angle. Uh, you can give systemic carbonic anhydride inhibitors like acetylcholamide orally. Sodium chloride topical drops can be used to reduce the corneal edema. Treatment, uh, once the corneal edema settles, you can do a laser and make an artificial hole in the, in the peripheral iris to unblock that block, uh, the, the aqueous accumulation in the posterior chamber. Uh, ideally, you had to do a cataract extraction if the, it's a cataract, just bulky lens. If there's a secondary pose, you treat the secondary pose. Another topic, uh, again, flashes and floaters. Um, these are, this is also a sort of emergency, really. Uh, if it is an acute onset, uh, flashes and floaters. Now, floaters can be there, one or two floaters. We all have this appearance of a floater. If you look at the side, we generally have a floater, especially myops. But if you have had the same amount of uh, floaters for months and years, that is not an emergency, but if you have, if you had sudden onset, maybe increased number of floaters, then it is an emergency because this is associated with uh, vitreous degeneration, but vitreous is attached to the retina. So when the, when the vitreous degenerates, it pulls the retina, and if there is a susceptible area in the retina, you can have a retinal detachment. Retinal detachments have to be uh, corrected early. If they become chronic detachments, the prognosis, visual prognosis is poor. So you can't, if, the, if a patient comes with flashes and floaters or a sudden reduction in vision in one night, uh, better to do a proper dilated fundoscopy, three mirror as well, and exclude a tear uh, or uh, degeneration that can lead into a tear. Um, so this is an early tear. Retinal tear with detachment. This is a tear only, no detachment, and it has been laser. Right? So you treat it and you prevent blindness. These are the surgical options. I just put the names up in case you come across them for retinal detachment. So a big topic next diabetic retinopathy. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, uh, who gets it? Uh, people who have. Uh, type 1 diabetic are more prone to get it. The, the longer the duration they've had diabetes, they are more likely to get it. The poorer the control, they are more likely to get it. The dyslipidemia, anemia, hypertension associated, they are more likely to get. Uh, so who should be screened? We should screen all of them at diagnosis. And if there is no retinopathy, we should screen them annually. If they are on the uh, uh, treatment follow-up, they get reduction in vision, they have to be seen it. Right. So pathophysiology is mainly um, uh, changes in the vessels of the retinal vessels, basically. Uh, the uh, endothelial cells and all that gets damaged and because the sugar and all that. And you get uh, capillary leakage, leading to diabetic macular edema. So fluid leaks out of the capillaries into the macula. Macula is very susceptible to edema. So any fluid that leaks in the retina uh, tends to come into the macula. Really. Then uh, occlusion of the capillary and the microcirculation leads to ischemia. Ischemia produces inflammatory mediators and VEGF is one of the main culprits in uh, the pathophysiology of di diabetic retinopathy, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. Because of ischemia, the retina tries to regenerate uh, vessels that is called neovascularization, but it is harmful to the eye, actually. So clinical features, uh, everyone knows, I think, don't knows how to see dot and block images. They are just dots and blots, uh, and that those have bled into the retinal layers, inner retinal layers. And these are cotton wool spots. Cotton wool spots are dead uh, nerve fiber layers, um, just uh, irregular sort of fluffy things in the retina. This is an IRMA or intraretinal microvascular anomalies. These are um, uh, sort of a my, in the microcirculation, shunts between the arterioles and the venules. This indicates that there is a, the, in the capillary circulation is blocked, basically. 
IRMA or IRMA, some people call it IRMA. This is neovascularization. So what happens is when they, they just start secreting the retinal vessels, they start, start to grow. And this is an early neovascularization. And this is more a severe neovascularization. So it's like a frond. It grows along the retina. And at one point, it starts to grow towards the vitreous as well. And the natural history is that then later it just they, they become fibrous tissue. So they become fibrous bands and they contract. The fibrous band contracts and cause traction on the retina, right? So this is the natural history of, and they can bleed as well. So this is the natural history of uh, neovascularization. This is fibrous tissue here. Now it's forming, uh, becoming slightly fibrous. Later on, it will just become a fibrous band. This is neovascularization on the disc. You can see that the disc, uh, the neuroretinal limb is uh, completely obscured here. You can here, see here also there are some you know, vascularization. This is a fluorescein angiogram, uh, and you can see ischemia and neovascularization. These are venous changes, you see, venous bleeding um, here, and omega loop, looping, bleeding, dilatation. These are the venous changes you see. So the neovascularization elsewhere, neovascularization of the disc, and then venous changes, IRMS, hot and blue spots. Uh, you can also, I haven't put exudates here, dot and dot narrator. This is diabetic retinopathy, the basic classification. So you have uh, non-proliferative, proliferative or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and you have macular edema. Macular edema can occur with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or proliferative diabetic retinopathy at any stage, right? So in the boxes underneath each one, I have put the definition, the proper definition um, of, you know, uh, the severity craving. So, you know, there's like a one third disc involvement, etc. Uh, proper definitions. But basically, I'll give you a rough idea because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, in mild uh, diabetes, you just uh, non proliferative, mild diabetic retinopathy, you just get a few dot and dot images. By severe, you have IRMA in one or more quadrants, uh, but you have uh, venous changes and hemorrhages, uh, retinal hemorrhages, but you don't have proliferative changes. That is, NVEs, non neovascularization elsewhere, neovascularization at the disc. So any, uh, any neovascularization is present, it falls under proliferative, it, it's not there, it falls under non-proliferative, right? So uh, proliferative, like I said, you get neovascularization. When they are small, it's early. When they are big compared to the disc area, it's high risk. And uh, or if they are bleeding, if they are associated with the vitreous hemorrhage. Advanced is when you have a tractional retinal detachment. I told you that they become fibrous and they induce traction on the uh, retina. And if you get a tractional retinal detachment involving the macula, in neovascularization of the iris, neovascular, and which leads to neovascular glaucoma. Uh, extensive vitreous hemorrhage, these are features of advanced um, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Macular edema uh, can be center involved or center not involved. That's how we classify center involved means fovea involved, center not involved means paraphobia. So let's have some pictures. So this is a non proliferative mild diabetic retina. You have few, excuse me few ex ex uh, exudates, some few, very few dot and dot hemorrhages. Now these patients, and this is a mild diabetic retinopathy. This is a sort of a moderate diabetic retinopathy, but it's towards severe actually. So uh, yeah, anything in between mild and severe basically falls on moderate. You have more hemorrhages, more exudates, but they don't fall into the four to one rule. Right. So this is severe diabetic retinopathy. So you have cotton wool spots, hemorrhages um, in all four quadrants. You have venous changes here, venous bleeding, and uh, probably some there. 
நீங்க proliferative diabetic retinopathy this is actually a high risk one because you can see here these are all in yeast there are some in yeast also here this is a very large in yeast and uh, you can see the significant thinness in this by now uh, so this is a high risk it's a large in yeast it's a high risk diabetic retinopathy let's see This, these are pictures of advanced diabetic proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You can see here, top is bleeding, uh, and then what did you do something? I think uh, fibrous tissue here, the tractional bands. See also tractional bands in the macula, fibrous tissue. This is chronic VH seen through the uh, lens. So. This is a neovascularization of the iris. You can see the vessels here. They are not seen normal eyes. You don't see vessels like this. Center involved uh, maculidema. You can see here the exudates are exudates are the liquid and protein deposits that remain after fluid uh, that has come out of the vessels leaked out have been slightly absorbed. So the remnants of that fluid is what you call hard uh, exudates. Uh, so you can see exudates are indicated you know, because you can't see a three-dimensional view. You can't see the edema here, but this is highly suspicious of edema, and it is very close to the fovea. So you call this centering or macular edema. When you take an OCT macula or a scan of the foveal region, you can see the fluid there, and there the foveal contour is this distorted here. So this is centering or macular edema. And this is parafovia. So you can see that the center is not involved. It's a, there's a leaking micro aneurysm here. And you can see the peripheral halo of exudates. So this is a classification of diabetic retinopathy. So how do you manage and when do you reveal? Uh, I'm sorry about this picture. There's some, anyway. Um, non proliferative diabetic retinopathy is it's a mild one annual review and for all of this okay for all of these patients you have to have systemic control uh, i told you hpa1c has to be controlled blood pressure has to be uh, controlled hemoglobin levels and the lipid profile they all have to be controlled uh, to stop the progression and uh, For moderate, apart from that, you just uh, review them and the ophthalmologist uh, in one year. For moderate, uh, if we see them and classify them as moderate NPDRs, we review them six monthly. Monthly, if it's severe, because the risk of losing vision is so high, you have to review them very frequently and see whether they are going into proliferative retinopathy. Sometimes we even do FF uh, fluorescein angiograms just to see whether it is an early proliferative one which, which has been masked, and you can think of uh, treating them. Now, anti VHF injections, I have to move that picture, <laughs> it's obstructing. I will put that slide back up again at the end. Um, so, anti VHF injections have been tried on. Uh, recently, and uh, for severe non proliferative, but it's not really in the treatment algorithms at the moment. Proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy treatment, I will uh, remove this picture and put up this slide again at the end. So, proliferative diabetic retinopathy for early and high risk uh, uh, ones, and even in certain advanced ones, we can do laser, right? We have to do Uh, pan retinal photocoagulation or PRP. So this is a picture actually of uh, uh, retinal photocoagulation. You can see the peripheral retina has been lasered. So you, what we intend is to reduce the uh, oxygen demand uh, and reduce the ischemia in the retina. Macula and the, the, the area central to the retinal arcades, the vascular arcades are spare. Macula is there. So they lose peripheral vision. That's a compromise. So now also we also have a 
we also have uh, injections, anti VHF injections, but the problem with anti VHF injections is they, the effect of anti VHF injections only last a month, right? So, a month or the liver once two months. So, after that, you have to give it again. So, uh, because of that, you have to continuously give, uh, but this is a much more permanent solution, not later. In advanced uh, proliferative retinopathy, you do vitrectomy and surgery, basically remove all the attraction and the hemorrhages, and you can even endolase at the uh, setting of the surgery or do a PRP later. So, uh, advanced, of course, visual prognosis again would be poor. Uh, macular edema, if it is center involved, you can't do laser because uh, you're damaging the retina. So you give anti vegf injections. Again, you give until the macular edema settles. The earlier you start, the better it is, the more responsive it becomes. The, uh, the more chronic it becomes, then the chance that it will settle is also low. You can um, uh, give uh, dexamethasone implants as well but mainstay is anti vegf injection. If the center is not involved or areas where the center is not involved, you can give FLT, so focal laser treatment. This is not actually a burn, burn. It actually stimulates the retinal pigment epithelium to remove that fluid or faster. You're just stimulating, you're not burning the macula. Uh, that is different from PR. Okay? So you shouldn't actually get a scar after FLT. That is the management of diabetic retinopathy. Now let's look at hyperdensity retinopathy. There are many classifications, newer classifications. The oldest one is this Keith Wagner Bach classification, which I think we are all quite familiar with. So I put that one up, but there are lots of new classifications. So uh, you, you get the AV nipping and uh, the hemorrhages and uh, in the grade four one, you can get uh, the medicine hypertension features of papillary edema and retinal edema. So <laughs> this is a grade four one. You can see the AV nipping. AV nipping is because the vein goes on top of the artery and the artery, artery is constricted at that point, excuse me. Cotton, uh, cotton wool spots hemorrhages, and here there is a macular star. Macular star is evidence of macular edema. So, screening for hypertensive retinopathy, there is no need because we don't treat hypertensive retinopathy. Um, the physicians treat the hypertensive retinopathy because the management is to control the blood pressure. So, the, we don't screen them. If you want, we can uh, look at the uh, retina and tell you the grade or things like that is necessary, but purely the management is uh, hypertensive management. Nothing ocular uh, can be done. So you don't need to refer for hypertensive retinopathy per se. Just for diabetic retinopathy, you send, not for hypertensive. I'll talk a few words about central retinal vein occlusion. Central retinal vein occlusion is the, the occlusion of that vein coming from that optic disc, right? complete occlusion. And it causes this kind of picture in ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, where you get a lot of hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, and maybe this edema as well, appearance of disc edema. And uh, non it can be non ischemic, meaning that it's not that severe. It hasn't really caused the retina to become ischemic. Um, but the problem with now, so they have fairly better vision, no relative apparent visibility effect less number of cotton wool spots and hemorrhages and venous dilatation. Um, definitive diagnosis you can get with the fungus angiogram. So you can see here, the perfusion, the black areas are the non-perfused areas. You can see a lot of areas which are non-perfused. This is an ischemic area. Non-ischemic ones, it's the fluorescent angiogram, it doesn't show black areas. So this is a pretty well perfused retina. Problem is, is non-ischemic ones can turn into ischemic later on. So, commonest cause is hypertension, in, especially in old age. Um, age is a risk factor. Apart from that, smoking, glaucoma, diabetes, dyslipidemia, these are all causes of narrowing of the artery, uh, vessels basically, that will cause the central retinal vein occlusion. And of course, the contents of the blood 
or some method to foster occlusion. So any uh, 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 blood related disorders, so coagulopathy associated, right? Uh, so most important thing is if they come in with CRVO, if you suspect them to have CRVO, sudden luxation, then you have to look for a systemic cause, mean the hypertension, check the blood pressure immediately and uh, treat. Um, then the next thing is macular edema, central retina vein occlusion is associated with macular edema, you give antivirus injections, you can give dexamethasone implants as well. Um, and then you have to monitor them because this is associated, especially the ischemic central retinal vein occlusion is associated with neovascularization and neovascular glaucoma. So you have to uh, monitor them uh, to see whether they get it. This is usually seen in the first 100 days of the glaucoma, but it can, you can see neovascular glaucoma coming up within the first two years after CRVU. After that, generally, uh, the risk is low. So uh, you have to do directed fundoscopy in uh, every visit in that initial period. Look for neovascularization if it's present. If you are suspecting it to be a very ischemic CRVO, you can prophylactically, sometimes you do prophylactical CRP because the patients, they don't come very regularly to us. Um, also, uh, if they are on antivagus injections for macular edema, this 100 day glaucoma can be delayed. The onset starts because anti wager prevents the glaucoma happening. But once the effect of the anti wager, or once you stop the anti wager injections, the 100 day glaucoma can start. So uh, it's, not, it's not really the 100 days from the onset, uh, it's actually after you stop the anti wager injections, more or less, if they are on it. Um, a word on age related macular degeneration. So ARMD can be dry or wet, so most commonly dry. So ARMD, what happens is uh, uh, when you age, things starts to accumulate between the retina and the choroid, called hypofusion, degenerative substances, and it blocks oxygenation of the retina. And uh, because of that, you get uh, atrophy of the retinal uh, layers in the macula. So you have atrophy in the macula, and uh, there are these trials, uh, antioxidant trials to prevent the progression. You have to stop smoking. Wet is when this progresses into neovascularization and you get in macular and all that, and then the treatment for macular edema and These are some pictures of age related macular degeneration. This is uh, CNV or wet ARM. Yeah, and last topic, uh, important topic, chemical injury of the eye. So chemical injury can be accidental, uh, related to an assault, or it can be occupational, like um, the stone queries and quarries and all that. They can have occupational injury. So alkaline injury is generally worse than acid because alkaline goes and suffocates uh, the uh, lipid layers of the cell membrane. So it, they tend to corrode into the eye. Acid, in the, on the other hand, they uh, denature the proteins and the proteins actually prevent the acid from entering further. So alkaline is worse. In Sri Lanka, lime injury is very common among children especially. They play with the grandfather's um, uh, lime used for beetle chewing of others. Or sometimes it's seen in schools where the child is asked to uh, paint the cricket ground with, with the lime and, you know, mark the cricket pitch with the lime and they get uh, alkaline scale. So the alkaline corrodes the globe uh, and goes inside and damages and burns everything up. Uh, and the other problem is, I told you earlier that the anterior segment is vascularized uh, or the blood supply to the anterior segment is from these uh, anterior blood vessels. So when those get burnt, you get ischemia uh, and you get uh, uh, ischemic damage to the anterior segment components of the eye. And uh, another important thing that gets burned are the limbal stem cells, which are very important in keeping a transparent cornea to allow light into the eye. Even if you have a normal retina, if your cornea is not transparent, you won't have vision. So 
The limbic stem cells are very important uh, cells, and if they're burnt, uh, it's hard to replace them. And of course, the ocular adenexia, the lids and the skin around the lid can get burnt and that can cause damage. Now, uh, of course, has it, or chemical injury can have grades. You can just have a mild injury. There's just hyperemia of the conjunctiva um, and uh, you can just wash it off and the rest of the, the eyes, the cornea is clear, the vision is okay. And uh, that kind of mild injury can happen. But rarely, especially with things like Lyme, you can have very severe injury. So you, uh, some of the things, now in the first picture A, you can see the whiteness of this eye in the periphery. This is not a normal whiteness. This is due to ischemia. This whole area is completely burnt. All the vessels are burnt out. So the, although it looks white, this is not a uh, healthy white. This is just ischemic whiteness. The cornea is also burned and most likely um, the, the chemical also penetrates into the eye and later on the patient will get a cataract as well and uh, iris burn. Uh, so, and the angles also get burned and uh, the intraocular pressure also tends to rise. So these are the sequelae of the globe proper and there is a severe chemical injury. This is an epithelial defect and a corneal opacity due to chemical burn, burn, acute chemical burn. The limbus is not that ischemic. The vessels are dilated due to inflammation, but it's not that ischemic. So whiteness is a misleading sign. You have to make, you have to examine for sure and see that there is no limbal ischemia. If there is limbal ischemia, you have to do a quinones at once. Quinone is that um, the, the connective tissue are covering the globe that I told you about earlier. It's there in the posterior aspect where the burn probably hasn't reached. So you can pull the tenons to the front and get the limbus uh, revascularized. That has to be done in the acute stage. Once melting has started, it's very difficult to re-establish a blood supply. This is, uh, so obviously chemical burns, blinding, disfiguring, it's very, the patients are uh, depressed for life. They have socioeconomic problems. How do you, uh, these are some of the uh, pictures. You can see that this globe is quite intact, but you can see the lid has been burned and there is a tropian, there is a cicatricial tropian and the lid can't close. And that will uh, lead to secondary damage of the globe. Here there is, this bit is ischemic, that is. And uh, you can see the, whiteness of the cornea. Here you can see if you haven't actually pulled down the lid, you won't see this damage. Um, this part is normal, but here the acid or the, the lime has remained there and corroded into the stinger. This is a very severe uh, damage patient. The whole face was burned, this one of our patients. Uh, the lid, you can see the lid, they have uh, the burns unit has been managing the skin. Uh, but you can see the severe damage to the lid and ischemia at the, you know, the, the inferior sclera. Uh, this is the other eye of that same patient. You can see that it's completely melted. Actually, the lid was completely melted. The uh, lid had to be grafted, but by the, by the time all of those things, grafting and lid reconstruction happened, the eye was definitely melted. Um, so, uh, Primary care and secondary care. Primary care is the most important thing. And you have to do it as soon as possible. And if you don't do this, it, is, it can be called medical negligence, which is actually medical negligence because the patient will go blind. So please don't take long to address a burn patient. You, uh, the eye, if, if there's any suspicion in a burn correction, comes that the eye is involved, irrigate the eye thoroughly. 20 minutes is just a just a rough guide, you have to do it longer. Uh, ideally, you have to have put litmus paper and until it neutralizes, you irrigate. But if you don't have litmus, we don't have litmus in Sri Lanka. So you irrigate thoroughly with normal saline. If that's not available, distilled water or at least clean water. Irrigate immediately and thoroughly and as long as needed. If the patient is uncomfortable, you can put lignocaine drops 
into the eye and anesthetize the eye and then do the irrigation. And then you can direct the jet of saline under the lids uh, and remove any particles. Now, uh, alkaline, especially lime and the cement can be uh, sort of lodged in those cornices or the pockets of the conjunctine and the lids. So you have to pull the lower lid down, examine the lower lid, clean the lower lid of any particles with a cotton bud, invert the upper lid and then clean the upper lid also of any particles. If the particles remain, even if you have irrigated, if the particles remain, they can forodine and cause ischemia further. So until you send them to a secondary care unit, you have to remove those particles. Otherwise, it, within 24 hours, it will just burn. Right. That is medical negligence. So you evert dye, clean with the cotton bud or irrigate properly. If there is significantly edema and you think you cannot evert it, then, um, or you suspect lobe injury, sometimes these things, uh, alkaline burns are associated with blasts and all that. So if you suspect a globe rupture also to be there, then uh, you can transfer to a, a, a immediate transfer basically, uh, inform and transfer, so that the patient can be checked at a theater uh, and evert, the lids can be inverted and clean immediately. There shouldn't be any delay, right? And uh, antibiotics and steroids can be started. Antibiotics, um, frequent antibiotics and frequent steroids. Steroids, again, make sure that the history, uh, there is no reason to suspect uh, uh, contamination with uh, germs. So that's the management in the primary care setting. Secondary care, uh, what we do at an eye unit is basically the minute they come in, we examine and look for limbal ischemia. If there is significant limbal ischemia, if it's a very severe uh, uh, burn, or there is a persistent epithelial defect, large epithelial defect, then you have to do plan and do a tenon advancement. Uh, if not, we can still take them immediately to the theater, examine under the theater microscope, remove any particles and irrigate. Then, chronic management uh, starts once the acute phase for the first two, three um, uh, weeks have passed with tenon advancement and mutic membrane graft uh, are done and the inflammation which is actually what causes these chemical veins also have a uh, cause severe inflammation and the inflammation itself causes melting. So initially you need a lot of steroids to stop the autolysis basically. Um, and then once that is done, you start lid reconstruction, then ocular surface reconstruction, and only later you start the vision rehabilitation. So this, this is a very chronic, long, tedious process and the visual prognosis is also guarded. You can't promise a good visual prognosis. It's mentally challenging to the patient and the surgeon. So this is the story. So primary care is very important. Uh, you have to uh, uh, see the patient immediately, irrigate thoroughly, do not uh, let any particles remain under the lids. Uh, that's the take home message. I have just put some other uh, things like relative references, relative effects, how to check in the torch. Uh, there were questions on uh, investigations. I do not know whether we have enough time to go through all that. Uh, so shall we go to uh, questions now? And with the questions, maybe we'll be able to discuss these things. Yes, madam. Uh, there were a few questions in the chat box. Um, what is the drug can be given to neonatal eye discharge due to duct obstruction other than massage? Uh, we can give a fusitalmic ointment, which is uh, safe. But um, again, if it is a neonatal eye discharge, uh, infantile eye discharge, you can give a fusitalmic ointment. 
but for neonatal discharge, I think for neonates, within the first month, if there's an eye, eye discharge, I think you should refer to an uh, ophthalmologist because uh, of the significance of the virulent, uh, virulent organisms like gonorrhea, chlamydia, HSV, and all that. Uh, I think we can't take a risk with neonates. Best to re uh, refer. Infants, you can, uh, if it's a very clear discharge, you can keep with a few standing ointment, it's safe. Then how frequently a patient with diabetic mellitus should be screened for diabetic retinopathy? Uh, I actually spoke about that in the presentation. So at the di uh, diagnosis, at the point of diagnosis, you must send so that we know the baseline, what the patient is having. If they're at the baseline, if the patient is not having any retinopathy, then send them annually. If they are having retinopathy, we will decide and tell you when to send again. We will tell the patient to come again, basically. So I told you with non-proliferative disease, if it's a moderate non-proliferative disease we, or severe, we'll be seeing them more frequently. Proliferative, of course, we, are, we treat immediately. Uh, and maculidium also, we treat immediately. So mild uh, non-proliferative disease or no diabetic retinopathy at the time of diagnosis, when you send to us, we will see them annually, send them to us annually. Then what is the adv uh, advice and treatment for screen-induced headache, blurring of vision for students? Right, that is a common uh, problem students have these days. So if there is blurring of vision with screens, <coughs> excuse me, I think they should uh, first thing you have to exclude a refractive error. So uh, uh, send them to be screened for spectacles, right? Uh, so if they have a spectacle error, they have to wear uh, spectacles even when at near work with their myopy. Uh, and uh, you can put an anti reflective coating to protect from the glare. Uh, that will reduce the headache. And of course, you have to exclude other sinister causes as well. Young females may have benign intracranial hypertension and all that. So you have to look at the discs as well and uh, for the headache. Um, the other thing is you, uh, dry eye. Dry eye can also uh, cause uh, a headache because of the irritation. Screens, are not, screens can induce computer vision syndrome. That is, uh, when you're working in a screen for a very long period, your blink rate starts to reduce. And uh, generally, you work in a closed up environment, which will dry up your uh, tears anyway, uh, in, increase evaporation of the tears. And uh, because the blink, because the reduced blink rate, the, the production of tears and the spread of tears is also less. So you get dry eye symptoms. So you get the grittiness, and that can lead to headache as well. So you can treat the dry eye. Uh, treat any refractive errors, look for other causes of headache and treat. And uh, uh, finally, for computers and devices, as I said earlier, all devices use at a distance. Do not uh, get it close to your eye. Do not work at very close distances. And while you're working for computer vision syndrome, what we uh, tell the patients to do is to uh, every 20 minutes, if possible, to look outside the window at a distance of distant object and maybe blink once or twice. Uh, if that is impossible, if they, they don't have a window close by, keep the eyes closed for 20 seconds at least. Um, so if they need basically they need a break at least every 20 to 30 minutes from their work. So that will reduce the headache. Uh, what is the management of welding arc eye? Management of welding arc. So welding arc eye, uh, uh, welding arcs basically uh, uh, that the ultraviolet rays of the welding arc can burn the epithelium, right? And also cause a uveitis. So the, and of course you have to exclude the, well, during welding, you, they get the uh, metallic foreign bodies can come at high velocity and lodge in the cornea, or it can even per can it perforate and go inside the eye and cause an intraocular foreign body. So once those things are uh, eliminated, and you know for sure that it's just burn of the epithelium, 
and maybe a uveitis. Then you treat off with uh, antibiotics. These are prophylactic antibiotics. You don't want a secondary infection with uh, the normal flora. So you treat with antibiotics, you treat with uh, uh, lubricants to make it easier for the epithelium to grow back. Once that is healed and you're working at an eye unit, you had a look at the cornea in the slit lamp, then you can, if there's trauma, well, if there's UVIT is also associated, you can start a steroid. But uh, best uh, to uh, make sure that you are working in a, uh, I mean, you have seen the patient in a, under a slit lamp before starting steroids. Uh, then what is the link between giant arthritis and vision reduction? Um, so giant cell arthritis uh, uh, can uh, involve the uh, blood supply, supply vessels of the eye, and uh, you can get sudden reduction in visual acuity, seen commonly in the old age group. And uh, this is also a, a medical emergency because uh, not because we can save that eye actually. The optic nerve disc uh, is ch chalky white and basically the vision uh, goes down to almost NPL immediately. But it's an emergency because the other eye can get involved and also other uh, organs in the body can also get involved uh, by the, giant, the systemic disease. So uh, you have to suspect giant cell arthritis and do immediate uh, full blood count, ESR, um, uh, and uh, then uh, you have to start treatment with uh, intra intravenous methotrexone. Then uh, has been asked as uh, how long can we use lubricants? I think this is uh, connected with that. Uh, adenovirus skeletal. Well. Mm, no, uh, Madam, the, in the, uh, Screen induced headache, blurring. All issue. right. Uh, so, for children, little children, uh, best to use preservative free lubricants. So, preservative free because uh, chronic use of preservatives can damage the ocular surface a little bit. So, preservative free lubricants you can use for about two, three months. Um, and then, uh, of course, meanwhile, you have to tell them the uh, hygienic and the good ocular habits and uh, Otherwise, you might not be able to tell them off it. Uh, so you can use for two, three months, which it's preservative free. Even with preservatives, you can use them for two, three months. No, no, there's no problem with that. But uh, uh, if there's preservatives, best not to use them very frequently. So less than three, three times a day or four times a day would be ideal for about three months. Then, madam, uh, what is the type of eye discharge in chlamydia conjunctivitis? Uh, chlamydia, again, you can get a uh, mucoparulent discharge again. Uh, so chlamydia infections can be different. Like uh, dolls can get chlamydia infections. Neonates can get uh, chlamydia infections. Depending on the serotypes, it, the presentation can be a little different. So... Uh, uh, depends really on there are many uh, many uh, serotypes causing the adult and the child version of it child version can be new okay. those are the uh, questions in the chat box madam right should we do you want to continue that session? Uh, do we have time or all right so that is some questions asked uh, let me share this there are some questions Sent before, uh, I think. Uh, about investigation, I, I believe these were sent by um, uh, doctors working at uh, IUNIT, so these are a bit more detailed. Uh, relative afferent pupillary defect, so uh, this is how you check it. Basically, uh, if you are in blunt trauma, sudden loss of vision, you have to check a relative afferent pupillary defect. Uh, to know that the optic nerve and the retina are both okay. So what you do is you shine a to to torch at the normal eye, uh, basically at the two eyes um, from a distance. Uh, because we have dark pupils, it's difficult to die dark eye disease. We, it's difficult to see the pupils, so you need a background light. And then you shine a torch 
between the two pupils. You hold the, uh, the light in the normal, apparently normal, the, what, the eye that you think is normal for about three seconds, then swing it to the eye that you think is abnormal for another three seconds and look at it. So if the pupil dilates in the abnormal eye, uh, that means it's a relative apparent pupil. Right? You only need one working pupil to check the relative apparent pupil. So if it, if it dilates, that means you're, you're basically comparing the two eyes, the apparent pupillary reflexes in the two eyes. So one is weak. So that, that means there is a retinal ganglion cell or nerve cell problem. No nerve. This is the uh, OCT. There was a question about OCTs. So OCT is just a technology, scanning technology, basically imaging technology that can be used to scan any anterior segment, posterior segment, or the optic nerve head. So uh, basically, um, in glaucomas, we commonly use it. In uh, uh, suspected macular edema, you use it. Um, and even in um, other corneal diseases, we use it. So this is you now to know how to interpret the scan. You have to know the layers of the eye. So in the retina, now, this is basically this dark line in the bottom is the retina pigment epithelium. That is the epithelium between the choroid and the inner neurosensory retina. This bit, the outer bit, is the photoreceptors. Then you have the bipolar cells and the innermost you have the ganglion cells. And this bit uh, is the inner plexiform or the ganglion cell uh, axons. Right? This is the foveal dip. This is the OCT of the macula. So this is roughly the layers. I mean, you can identify each individual layer separately, but that is just the orientation of the cellular layers. Now, in macula edema, you can see here the neuro, the the art retina pigment epithelium or the epithelium between the choroid, choroid capillaries, and the neurosensory retina. This is normal, but you can see the neurosensory retina. Is edematous. Yeah, so this is a non senti involving macular edema. This is a senti involving edema. The foveal reflex has vanished. Mm. Now, in this case, this is an age related macular degeneration. I told you that uh, in age related macular degeneration, you get uh, degenerative substances accumulating under the retinal pigment epithelium. These are known as drusens. So you can see that the, this white line, which is the retinal pigment epithelium, is elevated. This is the retinal pigment epithelium in the picture here. So that is elevated at places and there are substances under it. Right? So this is a basic idea of an OCT macula. Uh, this is OCT, RNFL, and ganglion cell analysis. This is done for glaucoma. So you can see that. Here, they have analyzed the nerve fiber layer or the retinal nerve fiber layer close to the optic nerve head, right? So, uh, you can see it. Then, then they have basically uh, put the thickness into a graph. You can see here, this is the graph. This bit is the superior part of the disc. This is the inferior part of the disc. And the green means normal, red means abnormal. This is slightly marginal in the superior bit, so suspicious glaucoma. This box gives you the summary of the pop to disc ratios and all that. Average size, pop to disc ratios and all that. The ganglion cell analysis is done at the macula where the ganglion cell complex is analyzed and you get the thickness here in, as an OCT. And this thinning, now this is not uh, glaucomatous thinning, but uh, uh, so, uh, maybe advanced locomotors thing. Here, this is very suggestive of locomotor because the two hemispheres, um, the superior, sorry, superior and the inferior retina is asymmetrically thin. The inferior retina is thin. You can see superior retina at the macula is normal. So this uh, is a suspicious locomotor thinning at the macula. This is the suspicious locomotor thinning at the uh, no optic nerve head. So you request RNFL and ganglion cell analysis when you suspect glaucoma. 
uh, somebody had asked about ultrasound imaging. Uh, ultrasound can be used to differentiate a vitreous hemorrhage from a retinal detachment, basically at the emergency setting. But if the fundus can be viewed, you just need a dilated fundoscopy. You don't need a um, B scan. Um, and B scans are at the moment quite a luxury to have in Sri Lanka. Like the eye hospital only one B scan machine is working. I have put up some people have also asked about guidelines. So we have HCQ retinopathy screening guidelines, which are available at uh, just Google. Uh, COSL, that is College of Ophthalmologists of Sri Lanka and HCQ written up with the screening guidelines. We also, the COSL has also published guidelines on uh, retinopathy of prematurity screening. We don't have diabetic retinopathy guidelines on, uh, sorry, guidelines on diabetic retinopathy yet, but if there's anybody interested, they can uh, read the Royal College of Ophthalmology guidelines. Um, for glaucoma, the Asia Pacific glaucoma guidelines again can be downloaded. It's very good. It gives you diagrams and explanations on how to detect cupping. I suggest that you read that. That is very informative. And of course, the uh, College of Ophthalmologists have received, uh, released a glaucoma handbook. Uh, this is not available online, but you can, uh, I think, copies have been sent to eye units. Uh, please, if you are interested, it, it, this is also a very good handbook. Um, then, uh, uh, this is the retinopathy of prematurity guidelines. Those are pretty much the guidelines available. So, if anybody is working in, at, at an eye unit, the glaucoma hand guidelines and the diabetic retinopathy guidelines will be very useful, I think. Um, so, that's it. All I have, the pictures are from our own unit and the web. You uh, can skip. Uh, there are a few other questions also, madam. All right. Chlamydia infection is said to cause visual impairment worldwide. What about the statics, statistics in our country? We don't have a lot of chlamydia eye infections. Not very uh, common disease. Then uh, what about long-term use of Optio for screen-related eye pain? Long-term meaning, um, so anything for very long duration is meaningless because you uh, prevention is the best way than treatment. Uh, Optio is better than, uh, because a brand name was uh, has come in the question, I'll uh, refer to that. Optio is better than, say, refreshed tears because the, uh, the preservative is less harmful to the eye. So you can use it long term. It doesn't matter. Depends on the course why you are using it, uh, Optive. So some patients with, say, Steven Johnson syndrome or meningomian gland dysfunction, where they really need to use tears for very long, years and years and years, because their tear glands are not working, then yes, you can use tears for very long periods of time. But if it's a, a secondary cause, if you haven't addressed the secondary cause, best to address that before using it for very long periods of time. But it's not, I mean, you can use it for three months, six months, even years, it doesn't matter. But uh, Optiv still has a preservative. Optiv UD is a uh, daily uh, teardrop. I mean, it comes in sachets where, which has to be discarded after one to two days. It's a preservative free drop that can be used for longer periods. If cupping, if cupping sits, but uh, intraocular pressure is normal, what is the management if uh, there are no comorbidities also? If you see cupping, uh, that is highly suspicious of glaucoma. Uh, you can still have a normal IOP. You can call it normal tension glaucoma if you like. Uh, but again, uh, sometimes there can be cupping that is not glaucomatous as well. So the patient just has a um, the appearance of cupping, but actually the nerve, the nerve fibers are not dead. So what we do is we do this uh, OCT, RNFL, and ganglion cell analysis. These will give us some better idea of whether it is a glaucomatous type of uh, cupping or not. So structural changes 
you have to see because structural changes always precede precede functional changes. So structural changes to check for structural changes, you do OCT, RNA cells, and uh, gangrene cell analysis for relate with the visual field also. Uh, and then uh, you can also do, um, I mean, you can, if you're really not sure, what we do is we observe them in repeat the tests in about four to six months. If there is a change in the OCTs, showing that there is a progression of glaucoma, that means it's glaucomatous. If there is no progression, maybe it's just how their discs look like, or it's another cause for uh, depth of the nerve fiber layer. So that's how we interpret that. Uh, now we have reached the end of the end of today's session. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting and very informative uh, lecture matter. Uh, also, uh, thank you very much for allocating your precious time uh, on behalf of today's program. Uh, the link for applying uh, e-certificate for participation has been sent to the chat box. Also, we admire your feedbacks uh, on, few, uh, on development of future, for, uh, future programs. Uh, thank you for all participants and also for the organizing team. Have a good day.